My title again is, is Human Intellect Degenerating, and um, this comes from an article that uh, Gerald Crabtree, who is the David Korn Professor of Pathology and Developmental Biology at Stanford, uh, wrote called Our Fragile Intellect. And um, for those of you who want to look up the uh, reference, it's there. And it was published in Trends in Genetics in two parts. Uh, that's behind a paywall. The, the link I gave is free. And uh, Dr. Crabtree starts out by saying, I would be willing to wager that if an average citizen from Athens of 1000 BC were to appear suddenly among us, he or she would be among the brightest and most intellectually alive of our colleagues and companions. We would be surprised by our time visitor's memory, broad range of ideas, and clear-sighted view of important issues. I would also guess that he or she would be among the most emotionally stable of our friends and colleagues. I do not mean to imply something special about this time in history or the location, but would also make this wager for the ancient inhabitants of Africa, Asia, India, or the Americas of perhaps 2,000 to 6,000 years ago. And in case you're wondering, the uh, figure is that of Pythagoras, who, among other things, discovered the Pythagorean theorem, and he or one of his followers uh, was the first to propose that the Earth was not the center of the universe, that uh, there's some suggestion that they may have even proposed that the sun was. I mean to say simply that we Homo sapiens may have changed as a species in the past several thousand years, and we'll use 3,000 years to emphasize the potential rapidity of change and to provide a basis for calculations, although dates between 2,000 and 6,000 years ago might suffice equally well. I like that 6,000 years, actually. Um, <clears throat> the argument that I will make is that new developments in genetics, anthropology, and neurobiology make a clear prediction about our historical past as a species and our possible intellectual fate. The message is simple. Our intellectual and emotional abilities are genetically surprisingly fragile. How many genes are required to carry on our everyday tasks? Read a book, care for a loved one, conceive of a just law, or compose a song? An accurate answer to these questions is critical to understanding our genetic fragility. The larger the number of genes required, the more susceptible we are as a species to random genetic events that reduce our intellectual and emotional fitness. Recently, the means to answering this question have emerged from genetic studies and insights into the human genome. Several lines of evidence and classic as well as modern genetic studies have converged to indicate that the number of genes required for normal human intelligence and abilities might be surprisingly large. As biologists, we commonly think in terms of traits controlled by single genes. And gene, indeed, the one gene, one protein paradigm was a critical part of our education in the thought that one protein did one thing, governed much of the thinking for the past 50 years. Hence, I was recently, when I recently mentioned to a group of my colleagues that the average Greek of 1000 BC might be intellectually and emotionally superior to our average present day colleagues, they raised the objection that this was impossible because the most recent estimates of the frequency of random mutation in yeast is about 3.80 times 10 to the 10, minus 10th, or perhaps 8.4 times 10 to the minus 9th per base pair per generation. Furthermore, the vast majority of these random mutations do not influence the function of a gene. Hence, if you imagine a small number of intelligence gene, genes that control this trait, our abilities would not be affected during the course of 3,000 years. 100 to 150 generations is all. However, modern genetic studies in mammals are suggesting something very different than this simple analysis. Perhaps the most effective way to estimate the number of genes in humans needed for full intellectual function comes from the studies of X-linked intellectual deficiency. Because there's but one X chromosome in males, the effects of, that should be effects, but that's why they spelled it, of chromosome mutations cannot be rescued or compensated by the second copy as for other chromosomes. Present studies indicate that mutations of about 215 intellectually deficiency genes, or as he calls them, ID genes, on the X chromosome gives rise to X-linked immunodeficiency, uh, pardon me, intellectual deficiency and or emotional disability. 
Present estimates indicate that there are 818 human X chromosome protein uh, coding genes of a total of 19,586 genes. And he gives a reference. Thus, this line of evidence indicates that about one-fourth of genes on the human X chromosome are needed for full intellectual and emotional function. 26% if, you be, if you're being precise. Uh, of the 215 genes on the X chromosome that give rise to X-linked immuni uh, I want to keep going to immunodeficiency, intellectual deficiency, when mutated 80, 86 have been characterized and do not seem to be neomorphs, that is, a gain of inappropriate function. So in other words, they're all actually deficient. Um, if we derive our estimate from this group of characterized genes, a more conservative estimate of uh, about 10% of the genes of the X chromosome are necessary for normal intellectual and emotional function. Because mutation of any one of these genes gives rise to compromise, we can state that these genes do not operate as a robust network where you can take several hits before anything happens, but rather as links on a chain in which the failure of any one of the links gives rise to deficiency. If the X chromosome is not enriched, and he proposes that it is not, for those required for intellectual development, there should be between about 2,000, that's the 10 percent, or 5,000, that's the 26 percent, genes needed for intellectual and emotional function. The X chromosome does not appear to be enriched for ID genes as shown by the di distribution of unmapped autosomal loci. In addition, autosomal recessive mental retardation seems to be very heterogeneous even within a genetically similar background, indicating that it is due to mutations in many genes. Many of these genes appear to function quite indirectly, such as BRM, one of two ATPA subunits of BAF chromatin regulatory complexes. Now, stop right there and notice what he's saying. Intellectual function depends on ATPA subunits of chromatin regulatory complexes. In other words, stuff that has to do simply with the machinery of running a cell period which gives you an idea of the wide variety of different kinds of genes that can go wrong and give one a, uh, uh, a problem with mental function. Uh, it isn't just ones that have to do with neural cell wall structure, for example. Although BRM would not normally be considered an intelligence gene, or contribute to the origin as an abstract thought in humans, even minor point mutations give rise to mild to severe mental <coughs> retardation in humans. BRM and its homolog uh, play critical roles in chromatin regulation in many species. A critical point is that a gene not, need not be human or brain specific in its function to be essential for our specific human intellectual abilities. A third estimate of the number of genes that function like links on a chain to support normal intellectual and emotional function can be made by assaying how frequently human genetic diseases in general have an intellectual deficiency component. This analysis is more difficult than it might seem, but a recent study of the OMIM database indicate that about one half of all human genetic diseases have a neurologic component frequently including some aspects of intellectual deficiency. These figures are consistent with the rough estimate of 2,000 to 5,000 genes required for intellectual and emotional function. With this estimate in hand, we can revisit the calculations of how quickly our intellects might change with a reduction in selection. If the proper function of 2,000 to 5,000 genes are necessary for intellectual ability, then in the simplex case, the complex traits of emotional and intellectual fitness will drift with reduced selection at 2,000 to 5,000 times that of a trait specified by a single gene. Independent studies in humans using phenotypic, phenotypic methods have estimated that the germline suffers from about one deleterious mutation per average protein co coding gene per 100,000 generations. These are mostly point mutations that lead to compromise of gene function without totally inactivating it. Recently, direct sequencing of parents and their children have found about 
35 to 50 new mutations per genome per generation. You may remember uh, uh, Sanford's estimate of uh, uh, depends on uh, 60 to 175 at one point. So it's been reduced a little bit, but it's still quite high. Or about 5,000 new mutations in the past 3,000 years. Of these germline mutations, only a small fraction, less than 1%, will be harmful, and some vanishingly small fraction will increase fitness. Thus, direct sequencing, as well as phenotypic analysis, indicates that the germline suffers at least one deleterious mutation per average protein coding gene per 100,000 generations. If indeed 2,000 to 5,000 genes are necessary for intellectual and emotional stability, then about one child in 20 to 50 should suffer a new mutation affecting, and that should be affecting, intellectual function. Another way to state the same information is that every 20 to 50 generations we should sustain a deleterious mutation. Within 3,000 years, or about 120 generations, we, all, we have all very likely sustained two or more mutations harmful to our intellectual or emotional stability. So we're all mutants here. <coughs> a test of this estimated frequency of deleterious heterozygous mutations was recently published. A survey of 185 human genomes c contained on average about 100 heterozygous mutations predicted to produce a loss of function. Remarkably, about 20 of these were found to be homozygous. Often these mutations were in genes such as olfactory receptors that seem less important in humans and may be deteriorating due to lack of selection. Nobody really cares whether you can smell that well. This estimate was made on the basis of exon sequences and hence would miss regulatory mutations that are much more difficult to predict. In other words, maybe the, there's a mutation in the regulator and it doesn't affect the exon at all, but, um, uh, but it still affects the amount of the protein that's being made and therefore would affect the intelligence. Hence, it represents an underestimate of the number of deleterious mutations in current human genomes derived from different human populations with different migration routes in the past 50,000 uh, years. The number of mutations that lead to intellectual deficiency can be derived from examination of the frequency of mental retardation in the children of consanguineous marriages. If our genomes were free of such heterozygous mutations, there would be no tendency for mental retardation to occur in children of consanguineous marriage. Needless to say, this is not the case. For reasons mentioned below, the best estimates are derived from first-degree consanguinity, for which there's relatively little information. However, incidental reports indicate that first-degree consanguinity, uh, in which one-fourth of the genome is reduced to homozygosity, leads to mental retardation in about one-fourth to one-half of offspring and lesser degrees of consanguinity to lower frequencies. These fig uh, figures are roughly consistent with the estimate of two to three deleterious he heterozygous intelligent, uh, intelligence deficiency mutations per genome. However, heterozygous mutations affecting only one copy, um, and that should be affecting, are generally not considered likely to produce a problem without reduction to homozygosity by consanguinity or random chance. But new discoveries indicate that the human nervous system is uniquely susceptible to heterozygosity. Recently, Gage and colleagues have reported that line one repetitive elements in humans uh, transpose and appear to lead to gene inactivation in neurons. The somatic origin of these transpositions was demonstrated by direct sequencing of different brain regions by Faulkner and colleagues, who found that other repetitive elements could also transpose and insert into or control critical neurodevelopmental genes. Indeed, they have a strong tendency to insert into coding regions, and these insertions lead to transcriptional interruption. Thus, even if they insert into a long intron, they can be damaging. Over 7,000 L1 insertions were detected in three individuals. It's a huge number of insertions. 
The line one insertions d occur in neural stem cells and lead to clones of neurons with specific insertion sites. Gage and colleagues estimate that each neuron sustains about 80 line one insertions, indicating that most neurons would have a number of genes whose activity could potentially be affected. So even if your genome is nice and perfect to begin with, you have these things that uh, get in there and mess it up. These could be beneficial and lead to greater diversity, but this seems less likely based on the prior work of Boke and colleagues. Transposon inactivation would not be a problem if we were dealing with a uh, single or small number of intelligent uh, genes rather than several thousand that could lose function in a specific brain region. By random L1 insertion, heterozygosity is transformed into to a homozygous loss of function in a clone of neural stem cells and a focal defect in the brain. L1 insertions do not occur randomly, but rather target transcribed genes, indicating that they have a high probability <coughs> of inactivating a gene, and indeed insertion sites and ID genes have already been documented. Thus, if one were heterozygous for a gene involved in formulating speech, and this gene were lost in some of the neural progenitors for the speech regions, one would expect a specific loss of speech function, even if this gene were used for other essential embryonic processes. Many neurons with deleterious in insertions might be eliminated by their failure to form effective neural circuits, which could lower their impact on neural functions. One could argue that anything that occurs in nature must be good for us, but this line of reasoning is quite incorrect. More species have become extinct by natural means than are presently present on our planet. And, uh, there's no reason for us not to do the same, of course. Um, and internal parasites could be quite harmful, which of course are also natural. Natural does not mean good. A practical implication of these studies is that identical twins will be non-identical genetically in neuronal subpopulations and that hence the contribution of genetic factors will be underestimated in classic identical twin studies. You'll, they'll think it's not genetic because identical twins don't share it when in fact the reason they don't share it is because they're not technically identical. It is also worth noting that the number of genes that could comprise intellectual function by this means would be much larger than the estimate by the analysis of the X chromosome. Because even embryonic lethal mutations could be inactivated. In other words, ones that would normally not get, uh, not survive in a homozygous state could be inactivated by insertion of mobile elements such as line one transposons. Another less obvious consequence is that this route to homozygosity will make intellectual ability less heritable. And you will see why that's important in just a bit. The consequence is, is that selective pressure must be higher to maintain neurologic traits in general. And what is the selective pressure? That means if you don't have the right stuff, you die. Or at least you don't have kids. This makes the job of maintaining the 2,000 to 5,000 genes in good working order even more difficult. The simple lesson is that as a species, we are almost certainly more susceptible to heterozygous inactivation of ID genes than we had previously understood. Another route to homozygous inactivation, removing or altering both gene copies and therefore getting full-blown intellectual deficiency, in individuals already bearing a germline mutation in one allele of the estimated 2,000 to 5,000 genes required for intellectual fitness is a feature of the nervous system that has recently come to light. For reasons that are unclear, apparently between 10 and 50 percent of human neurons are aneuploid, that is, have chromosomal abnormalities that lead to breaks, losses, and duplications of genetic material. Again, it appears that aneuploidy might originate in neural stem cells and hence be clonal, thereby resulting in a focal loss of function in a specific region of the brain. Furthermore, neurons with aneuploid genes, genomes, form genetically mosaic neural circuitries as part of the normal organization of the mammalian brain. 
And euploidy of chromosome 21 is, of course, the basis of Down syndrome, which is accomplished by a reduction in inter accompanied by a in reduction in intellectual function and illustrates the effect of alterations in gene copy number. Copy number variation appears to have a role in several neurologic diseases, including autism, which for uncertain reasons has become more common in recent years. However, he says, the apparent uh, recent increase in incidence in autism may simply be due to greater awareness of the condition and in any event would probably not be impacted by the rate of mutation accumulation within a 50-year period. The above two arguments suggest that focal loss of heterozygosity might be an underlying feature of neurologic disease that would be difficult to detect by present-day genome sequencing approaches designed to find the genes at fault in human disease. In order to detect focal loss of heterozygosity, neurons from many regions of the brain would need to be sampled and their DNA sequenced. Aneuploidy and transposon insertion are non-germline routes to homozygous inactivation of a gene and are the reason that first degree consanguinity gives the best estimate of the frequency of heterozygous mutations in the human genome. As is the case with transposon inactivation of genes, clonal aneuploidy would lead to misinterpretation of the studies with identical twins, causing one to underestimate the genetic contribution to intellectual or emotional traits, as, and also confusing natural selection, trying to, find, uh, trying to ferret out these bad genes and get rid of them. As with retroposon insertion, focal aneuploidy would also reduce heritability of neurologic traits, making them more difficult to maintain by selection. A third and perhaps even more likely way that inactivation of one of the two copies of an ID gene could be damaging is through compound heterozygosity. The calculations mentioned above in recent population genome sequencing studies suggest that most of us are heterozygous for two or more of the 2,000 to 5,000 genes that appear to be required for intellectual function. Again, we're all mutants here. This brings up the complex issue of cooperativity between the ID genes. Presently, there are not easy ways of defining gene pairs that lead to reduced function when one allele of both genes is defective. Heterozygous inactivation of two or more genes encoding proteins within the same biochemical pathway, genetic circuit, or protein complex is known to produce reduced function. In other words, if you had one bad gene here and another bad gene in a related area, it's possible that you might survive with relatively normal intellectual function with one but, or the other, but once you have both, uh, then uh, you have obvious uh, deficiency in intelligence. One recent example is that human intellectual deficiency is produced by um, mutation of at least six subunits of NBAF complexes, which are large ATP-dependent chromatin remodeling complexes found in a specialized assembly in the ner nervous system. It seems quite likely that compound heterozygosity of genes encoding subunits within these complexes would reduce intellectual fitness, and indeed this is the case for NBAF sub subunits, an example of what we were just talking about. In general, it is quite difficult to know if loss of one allele in, for example, an enzyme removing a neurotoxic intermediate would exaggerate or lead to defects in an individual heterozygous for a gene required for, say, dendritic morphogenesis. These considerations make human genetic studies designed to find the genes at fault in human cognitive disorders quite difficult. Yet double or compound heterozygosity would almost certainly contribute to reduced function among the estimated 2,000 to 5,000 genes required for full intellectual and emotional function. One could argue that this group of genes operates as a robust network. That means that it'll take several hits before anything happens. Um, however, this cannot be the case since the criteria used for selecting these genes is that inactivation of any one of the 2,000 to 5,000 leads to reduced function, demonstrating that, if they, that they function like links on a chain 
rather than a robust fail-safe network. Reduced function due to double or compound heterozygosity may be expected to operate exponentially over time as deleterious heterozygous mutations accumulate in our genome at a linear rate. And if this all sounds like Sanford, it is a lot like Sanford. Just uh, in the intellectual and emotional uh, realms. Now, at this point he switches, and I'll probably move through this a little faster with a little more summary, uh, given time constraints. Um, but he says, if we're losing emotional and intellectual traits, how did we get them in the first place? And needless to say, this is one of the most important questions of modern anthropology. And the subject of much investigation and debate. Um, obviously, the debate is not settled in this case. I can only speculate, but it seems necessary and also just plain fun to step outside of my comfort zone and comment. So at this point, he is shifting from what is known on the basis of hard facts and reasonable inferences therefrom to um, what you might call speculation. One clear fact is that the expansion of the human frontal cortex and endocranial volume, figure one, which is thought to have given humanity our capacity for abstract thought, occurred about 50,000 to five and 500,000 years ago in our prehistoric African ancestors. We're going to get to figure one in just a minute. These ancestors did not have a written language and for most of their history probably did not have much of a verbal language. They also did not have organized agriculture that permitted life at high densities in cities and societies. Thus, the selective pressures that gave us our capacity for abstract thought and human mental characteristics operated among hunter-gatherers living in dispersed bands, nothing like our present-day high-density supportive societies. So he's saying that we, we got this way because the selective pressure was stronger. And there's figure one where you'll notice that um, the expansion of cranial capacity seems to go uh, get into the normal range at uh, what about 300,000 years ago, something like that, and then uh, actually gets up to the normal range and perhaps just a slightly bit above at about the time we have spoken, la spoken language and considerably f before uh, on the conventional scale of things we have written language. So, uh, and he'll say that uh, written and verbal language first appeared well after intracranial expansion and hence could not have been a driving force to, to achieve our present brain size. In other words, language, it came after um, intelligence and not before, which actually makes a certain amount of sense. You have to have intelligence in order to have language. Um, and furthermore, our intellectual capacity has not changed very much in the last 50,000 years. And how do we know this? Because different societies that went to different places all have about the same intelligence. The comparison he gives is South Americans versus uh, uh, the Sumerian civilization in Iraq. In addition, whether a migrating group lived as a high-density city life made possible by agriculture or as dispersed hunter-gatherers did not greatly influence their intellectual development. In other words, they, all human societies have about the same intelligence. And uh, so he's arguing, almost certainly our present-day abilities are a collateral effect of being selected for more fundamental tasks. because it seems clear that we developed the ability for abstract thought by being selected for abstract thought, it must be that life as a dispersed hunter-gatherer is more intellectually demanding than we would commonly think. And uh, in other words, it may be tougher to build a proper shelter than it is to compose a, uh, a uh, sonata. Uh, we know that most of our ancestors lived the dispersed hunter-gatherer life until about five to 10,000 years ago when the invention of agriculture led to our high-density societies, written language and lifestyle, somehow like we have today. 
And uh, surprisingly, it seems that if one is a good architect, mathematician, or banker, these skills were an offshoot of the evolutionary perfection of skills leading to our ancestors' survival as non-dispersed, uh, or pardon me, as non-verbal dispersed hunter-gatherers. To understand the extremes of selection that must have, been a, must have occurred when our ancestors went from using speed, strength, and agility to survive and began to survive by using thought, we have to consider the difficulty of optimizing 2,000 to 5,000 genes. For the reasons mentioned above, it seems that retrotransposon insertion in aneuploidy of neurons substantially re reduce her heritability of neuronal traits. Without going into the mathematics, when heritability of a trait is reduced, the selective pressure to maintain the trait is increased. One of the things he's not addressing, which Stan Sanford addresses, is that when you get 100% selectivity, everybody dies. So there is a limit to the amount of selective pressure that can be applied. Thus, extraordinary selective pressure was necessary to optimize and maintain such a large group of intelligence genes. This optimization probably occurred in a world where every individual is exposed to nature's raw selective mechanisms on a daily basis. In the transition to survival by thinking, most people, that is, our non-ancestors, the people who died, probably died simply due to errors of judgment or lack of an intuitive nonverbal comprehension of things such as the aerodynamics and gyroscopic sta stabilization of a spear while hunting a large dangerous animal. And you didn't throw the spear right and the animal turned on you and uh, you were there lunch instead. Um, one might think that our modern abilities could not have originated from a time fi uh, 50,000 to 500,000 years ago and selection based on hunter-gatherer abilities. You know, one might. Now, this is key when you're reading this kind of stuff. Um, but the uh, stuff he's writing. Um, the, um, when you're looking at this, you look at it as, you know, it couldn't have happened, but the comeback is always, but it did. And so if you start with evolutionary theory, you come up with, well, there must be a reason. And it's your job to find it out, rather than saying maybe the whole story is imaginary. We think of common hunter-gatherer abilities as crude and unrefined and not, and not intellectually challenging. How could our modern abilities be an offshoot of being selected in this way? And so he says, but it has to be, and so here's how it would work. Uh, it seems that the field of artificial intelligence may be making a significant contribution to this question. When this field was first born several decades ago, it promised household robots that would do all our daily tasks, you know, cook meals, take the dishes off the table, wash them, put them away, mow the lawn, fix the leaky rain gutter, repair a child's toy, and bring us freshly cooked croissants and coffee in the morning. Needless to say, we do not have these robots now, and none of the readers of this piece will probably ever benefit from such a household robot, although he mentioned that somebody thinks it'll happen in 10 years. Uh, this is true, even though such a robot would have the commercial value of the world's automotive industry. I mean, how many of you would buy a robot like that if it was reasonably priced? Um, paradoxically, things that we consider intellectual, such as playing chess, winning a Jeopardy, flying a jet plane, or driving a car, are fairly straightforward for a computer and do not require even a small fraction of the computational power required for common human actions. The point is that selection could easily have operated on common but computationally complex tasks, like building shelters, with the result of allowing us to do more computationally simple tasks, like playing chess. Indeed, mutation of any one of the 2,000 to 5,000 genes presents, prevents us from effectively doing these common everyday tasks, and selection for the ability to perform them would tend to optimize the function of the entire group of genes. But as mentioned above, the selective pressure would have to be remarkable. 
What might, when might we have begun to uh, lose these abilities? That's obviously a misprint there. Most likely we started our slide with the invention of agriculture, which enabled high density living in cities. Selective pressure was then turned to resistance to disease that naturally grow out of high density urban living. Uh, there's a subtle point that's missing here. If you have selective pressure, it doesn't just go away. What happens is that it intensifies and, and you go extinct because you still have the old selection. The only way you can relax the old selection is by letting mentally defectives continue to, leave, to live when they wouldn't have otherwise. A principle of genetics is that when one <coughs> selects highly for one trait, and that again is his misspelling, uh, such as resistance to infectious disease, other traits are inadvertently selected against. It is also quite likely that the need for intelligence was reduced as we began to live in supported high-density cities that made up for lapses of judgment or failure of comprehension. Community life would, I believe, tend to reduce the selective pressure placed on every individual every day of their life. And he adds the interesting comment, indeed, that's why I prefer to live in such a society. It's nice that if you make a mental mistake, you don't get killed for it. Several considerations could mitigate the validity of the argument that intellectual and emotional fitness are slowly decaying. Um, the most significant is the assumption that modern society has reduced selective pressure for intellectual fitness. And he's arguing that perhaps we do select for intellectual fitness. Um, maybe you tend to marry people who are more intelligent. Uh, an estimate of the frequency with which um, X-linked <coughs> Uh, intellectual de deficiency genes are also required for other functions can be derived from the observation that about half of X-linked uh, intellectual deficiency patients have syndromes that select these genes are used in the development or function of other tissues or organs as well as the brain. However, these other syndrome, uh, syndromic features appear not to be lethal and many do not impair reproduction. Hence, there would be little limit on the ability of these genes to be prevalent in the human population without s selection. The estimate that 215 of 818 genes on the X chromosomes are required for intellectual function accounts for the possible use of these genes in early development because these estimates are derived from viable individuals. While multiple use of genes could slow the rate of accumulation of mutations in intellectual fitness genes, in other words, they're getting selected for something um, or selected against for some other defect that they have besides intellect. If the estimate of the number of genes required is correct and the rate of accumulation of deleterious mutations is correct and selection only slightly relaxed, then one would still conclude that nearly all of us are compromised <laughs> compared to our ancient ancestors of Af Asia, Africa, Europe, and the Americas of, say, 3,000 to 6,000 years ago. Another common counter-argument to the possibility that we're losing our intellectual fitness raised by my colleagues is that we're under constant selection for our intellectual traits. Presumably musical ability, employment, and emotional stability may all have mating advantages uh, that would re reduce the rate at which mutations that re affect these traits become fixed in our genome. <coughs> This argument is clearly correct, but I fear it does not take into account the extreme selection that must operate to maintain traits dependent upon thousands of genes in the face of relatively low heritability of the traits due to non-germline inactivating operations within the group of genes. This is again the, uh, the princess in the pea that uh, Sanford talks about, uh, about how what you feel is the, the night's sleep and what's down below is the, the P's, the mutations, and there's all kinds of other things that cushion that. Uh, and, and while you're selecting for intellectual non-superiority, it may be that this is a person who had, for example, uh, a previous head injury. It has nothing to do with what happens uh, in their basic intellectual function and has everything to do with how mean their parents were at one year old. Or uh, or perhaps um, 
uh, how, um, how foolish they were to, to waste themselves too many times with drugs. And see, if you're selecting for intellectually inferior people, those people get selected out, but they don't have any problems with their genes. The problems are with other things. And so selective pressure, um, selective pressure can't select for good genomes. All it can do is select for good final types. Good in this uh, case meaning, uh, among other things, intellectually uh, sufficient. Um, and every time that you have other things that confuse the picture, the selection starts to select on them instead of on the genome. And so you lose the specificity of selective power. And that's the problem he's making. And there's thousands of genes, 2,000, 5,000, that you're trying to select. It's just, you can't get there. Yet another less compelling counterargument goes like this. Our generation has an intricate written language uses computers, drives cars, designs spacecrafts, and plays chess, which the ancients of several thousand years did not. Hence, we must be smarter than they were. This argument presumes that operating a computer or playing chess is more complex than building a house, farming, surviving in the jungle, or washing the dishes and putting them away, which he points out uh, is not necessarily so. However, as mentioned above, our nervous system evolved until recently to do common but computationally complex tasks very well. Hence, none of our modern abilities are different than just a retrofit of modes of thought that we've been selected to do as hunter-gatherers until the very recent invention of farming. Um, furthermore, the faults of this in this argument are easily revealed by the fact that an inexpensive handheld computer can beat all but the best chess players in the world. In addition, relatively little computational power is needed for flying a plane or driving a car. In contrast, the comp computational complexity of many common practical tasks is revealed by the immense difficulty of building a computer that could direct a household ro robot to do what humans do very well. Although obvious, the frequently drawn analogy between a computer and a brain is not a very good one. Among other differences, our nervous system has far more com computational units than any existing computer, operates in analog modes, um, and is electrochemical in nature. Humans play chess and accomplish other tasks using different strategies than computers. We don't think ahead in so many moves and, and so forth. Uh, we think of kind of flow and plans and stuff like that. Uh, nevertheless, the, re the difficulty of reproducing human tasks is one measure of how computationally complex a given task might be and what its intrinsic value might be. Uh, this is not to negate in any way rare intellectual skills that are very valuable in society. In addition to uh, common household tasks, another example of a very difficult computational program problem that humans do very well is the game of Folded in which players use their spatial intuition to predict protein structures. Foldit has been described as resembling a Rubik's Cube with a thousand faces. Yet humans beat supercomputers at this game much in the same way that we can take the dishes off the table, wash them, and put them away better than a supercomputer. Almost certainly, we are very good at Foldit because the game uses spatial reasoning and skills that were perfected and selected for in our nonverbal hunter-gatherer ancestors 50,000 to 500,000 years ago. In contrast, humans are bad chess players, probably because our brains were not selected for this kind of game uh, designed to perfect skills for organized warfare. And he's saying organized warfare is not one of the things we are selected for. Um, if we had survived the past million years based on our chess playing skills, we would almost certainly play a master game in far less than one second. Indeed, the only way the game could be made challenging would be to have a thousand pieces that could each make a dozen or more different moves. Now, it's hard to keep track of everything. In other words, a chessboard would look like a table full of dirty dishes that needed to be washed and put away. A truly a massive intellectual exercise which should not be diminished by the fact of, that many of us can do it. It seems too obvious to state, but the tautology applies. Our brains are good at the things they have been selected to be good at. So that's his, 
speculative answer to how we got up there when we're going downhill now. Um, inventing a bow and arrow, which seems to have occurred only about uh, once, about 40,000 years ago, was probably as complex an intellectual task as inter inventing language or coming up with a theory of relativity. Our intellectual abilities were highly selected at immense human expense to accomplish seemingly common tasks that required the perfected actions of 2,000 to 5,000 genes. Now, if the above argument is correct, one would predict that individuals in undisturbed hunter-gathering societies would be more intellectually capable than those of us in more modern urban distributive societies. Certainly, Jared Diamond, who has spent his career of 50 years among one of the few remaining such societies, uh, the uh, Papua New Guinea tribes, um, feels that this is the case, but also acknowledges the difficulty with testing the idea because of uh, difficulties with uh, consanguinity and uh, so forth. The hypothesis that genes critical to intellectual function are decaying could be tested by a form of genetic triangulation. And uh, we're going to see that in figure two in just a minute. Um, the sequences of genomes of many individuals whose last common ancestors spanned the period from present day to 5,000 years ago should pro produce an estimate of the rapidity of change and the level of selection operating on those genomes at various time intervals during this 5,000 year period. 5,000 years would probably be an adequate interval since it would span the invention of agriculture for several population groups, which enabled high density living in cities and the shift to selection for resistance to infection. To obtain the retired fitness, uh, fineness and discrimination, many genomes would need to be sequenced. And there's figure one where certain groups split off at a certain period of time. And of course, there's been changes here, and that always confuses the picture. Um, uh, but presumably, you could say when we started losing intellectual capabilities, if you were to do this. And my own personal speculation is that that uh, you're going to see a loss of intellectual abilities all the way around. But we'll see what happens with that. If we focus on the inter interval between 5,000 years ago and present day, we would need 100 genome sequences for a 50-year fitness map. Since each generation produces 2,000 to 4,000 signature new mutations, these could guide the temporal ordering. Uh, of course, the problem is that then you have people who migrate to different places who are of different genetic stock and then intermingle with the population at times. Um, if the genes that control our intellectual development act like links on a chain, only one conservative mutation in any two of 2,000 to 5,000 genes would diminish our intellectual abilities and also be difficult to detect with certainty because mutations that control the evolution of specific characteristics have often been found in regulatory rather than coding regions, full genome sequences would need to be determined. So we are talking a huge project if you're going to try to nail this down. In addition, many of the mutations would almost certainly produce weak alleles that might erode our abilities in subtle ways. However, as a first pass, an examination of the coding regions of XLID genes and those from the OMIM database having ID phenotypes, uh, that is to say, known genetic diseases that influence uh, uh, intellectual development, um, as well as memory and learning genes from other organisms, would be a good place to begin and would give estimates of the rate of emergence of alleles that might be deleterious in this large set of genes. I would be very happy to learn from this test that there is no substance to my argument, but it doesn't sound like he's anticipating that. If, on the other hand, such a study found accelerating rates of uh, accumulation of deleterious alleles in the past several thousand years, then we would have to think about these issues more seriously. But we would not have to think too fast. One does not need to imagine a day when we might no longer be able to comprehend the problem or the means to do anything about the slow decay in the genes underlying our intellectual fitness. This is not going to happen instantly. Nor do we need to have visions of the world's population docilely watching reruns of televisions that they can no longer understand or build. Um, 
there's a movie about that, and I can't remember what the name of it is right now. Uh, I think it's called Idiocracy, where the you know uh, the intelligent people don't have kids, and the less intelligent people do have kids, and uh, eventually the general population slides down to where uh, a normal person is recognized as the king, because. He's by far the most intelligent person in the world. Um, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. It is exceedingly unlikely that 100 or 200 years will make any difference at the rate of change that might be occurring. Now, I want you to notice this sentence here. We're almost done, by the way. Um, nor do we need to have visions of the world's population docilely watching reruns on televisions that they can no longer understand or build. Okay. Remarkably, it seems that while our genomes are fragile and built like a chain with many links, our society is robust almost entirely by virtue of education, which allows strengths to be rapidly distributed to all measure and members. The sciences have come so far in the past hundred years that we can safely predict that the accelerating rate of knowledge accumulation within our intellectually robust society will lead to the solution of this potentially very difficult problem by socially and morally acceptable means. But in the meantime, <coughs> I'm going to have another beer and watch my favorite rerun of Miami CSI if I can figure out how to work the remote control. <laughs> Remember about that uh, televisions that they no longer ha know how to build. <laughs> My guess is that he doesn't know how to build a television either, but uh, <laughs> Anyway, um, now my own take on this is Dr. Crabtree seems to be quite confident that our intelligence is deteriorating. Um, and his reasoning is uh, put, trying to make it crystal clear, that just about 26% of X-linked protein, protein coding genes grossly influence intelligence by experimental data. That if you multiply that by uh, 19,586 genes, we're talking about 5,147. Um, and he estimates that maybe we're overestimating this, and really it's only 10%. Uh, so we're looking at about you know, 2,000, uh, well, 1,958 genes. So he says somewhere in between 2,000 and 500 is his own personal final estimate, and I don't have any particular reason to challenge that. Now, half of all genetic diseases have a mental component, and a, half, a quarter to half of all children of first degree consanguineous parents are mentally retarded. Mm -hmm. So that gives you an idea of how much there is out there where we are all deficient. Uh, oh, yes, oh, uh, oh, just a minute. Can we get a, a microphone here? I just want to ask you to comment on the next to last thing. Half of all genetic diseases have a mental component. Ex explain. Well, okay. Uh, Give an example. Let's, let's take a, a, a obvious example, Down syndrome. Has an extra chromosome. Uh, gives you a thick tongue. Gives you a particular look to the eyes. Uh, gives you short, stubby fingers. But it also definitely has a mental component. But all, not all genetic diseases. No, we're not saying all genetic diseases. Say we're that. saying half of all genetic diseases. Um, phenylketonuria has a mental component. Um, let's pick another one. Huntington's Korea has a mental component. Also has, you know, twitches. Uh, uh, at the to or not, it's chorea choreiform movements, um, but that's a mental component. You know, they they have decreased intelligence. They have uh, uh, aggressive tendencies. A lot of them wind up in prison before they actually manifest for the full blown disease. Um, Huntington's Korea is a, and interestingly, Huntington's Korea is a disease of a repeat segment that does not code for protein. So that means that if we just look at the protein coding diseases, we're going to miss a few. Maybe miss a lot. We don't know. Um, 
Double gene defects may be worse than single. It may be that if you have you know, two genes that are bad, that the body has a harder time, or the brain has a harder time coping with it and doing all the right things, uh, than if you had either one of them missing. Um, and frankly, I think Dr. Crabtree is right when he makes these comments. And they're in line with Sanford, and Sanford says he's saying things that all the geneticists know in this particular area. We're we are, in all probability, de degenerating. It's interesting that Dr. Crabtree got this thing into the peer-reviewed literature. Uh, not that I think the peer-reviewed literature is automatically a brand that, uh, that sanctifies everything that's said, nor that if it didn't get in, that it wouldn't be true. But what it does say is that there are a lot of people who agree with him. Um, Dr. Crabtree argues that this deterioration started when we stopped being selected for intelligence and started being selected for resistance to bacteria and viruses. Um, he makes a point that uh, simple household tax tasks are harder to program than chess, and my own personal observation is that one of the things that's the hardest to program into computers is common sense. Those of you who've worked with computer programs know what I mean. You're typing away, and you do something, and you do something about 15 times, and the average human will pick up, you know, he wants to do this one next. The average computer, unless somebody has programmed into it to watch and see what your keystrokes were and say, do you want to do this again, will not figure that out. And you'll keep on doing the same repetitive stuff. It just, you know, it has no common sense until it's programmed in. Um, can we pass the microphone back here? Yes. Uh, the same is true for bureaucracies because they essentially function by rule-directed processes which do not handle common sense well. Uh, unfortunately, you're correct on that. Uh, Note that Dr. Crabtree's foundational assumption is that we are smarter than our remote ancestors, that is, the monkeys, uh, chimpanzees, and whatever. Uh, therefore, evolution must have been able to select for intelligence. <coughs> Note that there's no evidence that evolution actually can select for intelligence. It's just that, you know, we were here, we got here, God's not involved in the process, there's no intelligent guidance, therefore, some kind of mecha mechanistic process must have been able to do it. In fact, the previous argument that we're degenerating now mitigates against the possibility of us getting better and better until we suddenly started living in cities. I think, frankly, that Sanford is right. Evolution can't do the job, and it's a good, il uh, good evidence for the failure of the evolution paradigm. And I think beyond that, Sanford's evidence that um, everything is degenerating uh, argues that, um, that, there's, that there's a good reason to believe that, uh, that it hasn't been that many millions of years since we started having uh, various other creatures, including ourselves, that large mammals in particular just simply don't evolve upwards. The argument can be put, we are degenerating, the math says so. We once were improving, evolutionary theory says so. And if you don't count evolutionary theory as evidence, then the math is what counts. And in fact, the math counts against evolutionary theory getting us up to the intelligence level from which we are now apparently slipping. And the interesting thing is that, of course, the biblical record where it talks about there are giants in the land and, you know, people of uncommon physical and mental abilities and, of course, Ellen White expanding on that, uh, maybe they were right. And with that, I will leave it to other comments. I will point out for those of you who have elsewhere that you have to go that it is now 11.30. And I apologize for taking as much time as I did, but it's a complex subject, and I probably still haven't done it justice.
So those of you who can stay and comment are welcome to do so. Would you be so kind as to give us the references for these papers? Uh, if you go back to his original... Uh, Could you put that slide on? The slide? I'm sorry. Sure, I can do that. Um, um, if we can put that slide back on. And um, for those of you who got the email, and for those of you who don't, again, you're invited to... Uh, to give me uh, the email, and I'll be happy to put you on the list. Uh, and in fact, I can send you that specific one. Um, Jeff, aren't you putting that onto the website so that if you actually go to the website, you can get it from there? But um, uh, just, uh, let's see, I'll have to, it's way up at the top, so I don't want to back up. Um, And uh, there's, the, there's the reference. And all of those references are down below where he, uh, you know, he, he, he writes the paper and then he puts the references at the bottom just like you would for a, a regular article. Um, yes, we have a comment here. Uh, it's interesting, he, he, he talked about the L1 insertions. We talked about copy number variation. We talked about all these genetic diseases, and they all seem to be related back to a certain class of genetics, which is the transposable elements. Well, not all of it, but uh, some of it, yes. Um, there's a significant portion of it that is. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, it affects many things. And, uh, yes, yes. And as I was reading this, I was thinking of uh, uh, Bob Milashenko and his project because, um, although I don't know that that gives you all of the answers, it certainly gives you a great number of them. And uh, certainly uh, transposable elements are obviously not just good things here. Uh, in fact, in, in general, it, it would appear that there, that there are problems. You know, even single point uh, mutations. Right. May not just be a single point mutation, but may due to a, a transposon inserted down the genome causing a frame shift mutation, which when corrected leaves a single point uh, mutation. So when we talk just about SMPs, they also can be related to the sigma. They may not be at all, but it's interesting that there are in many of the aspects you see in the genetic. Uh, Deterioration. Yeah, I, I guess the thing I'm reluctant to say is that every single thing that we experience can be traced to that. Right. Um, yeah. No. no. Uh, now, uh, it, it is entirely possible that, uh, for example, uh, there were originally other corrective measures in the, in the genome uh, that were taken away, as well as the, uh, <laughs> as well as the. Uh, transposable elements that were inserted, which uh, in general wreak havoc. I mean, obviously, he doesn't have much use for them. No, well, I, but it's interesting when you even look at twins, that they are that not the identical. That the transposable elements uh, can, can mess up one twin and not another in some particular way. That's correct. And that's correct. And, and their brains are actually quite different. That's right. And uh, beyond that, this also gives you problems with the selective uh, with the selective pressure to try to just keep things good let alone improve them in that um, in that if you have transposable elements and they cause somebody to become let's say mentally deficient then if you're selecting against mental deficiency you are not at that point selecting against the person's germline uh, uh, the genome, you're actually selecting against that person's uh, finished genome, which includes these transposable elements. Uh, so it's one more that. thing, and a f probably a fairly big thing, that will confuse natural selection trying desperately to keep the genome pure. It's just, when you look at it from that point of view, you, you really don't see how you can build up 
It's a little bit like uh, somebody who can swim five miles an hour, really good, fast swimmer. And, uh, and he's in a, a river that's running 20 miles an hour downstream. You're losing ground. No matter what. No matter what. And you're losing ground at a rather rapid rate. But somebody is trying to tell you that he originally swam up that river before he started coming back down again. And it, it just doesn't make sense. If the process can't work now to keep things even, how do we expect it to be, have been able to build things up? Well, I think as, as Sanford said, it's always down, not up. It's always down, not up. And that's the, that's the whole point. The, the point of it is, the part of his article here that is backed up by data you know, is actually pro Sanford. Right. The thing, right away, the thing that I find frightening is the hypothesis of um, that he proposes as, well, implied solution is that we don't have enough selective pressures. And there is not a great step from that conclusion to some regime at some point just deciding, well, why don't we just get rid of all the riffraff? The mentally defectives? Yes, yes, and it the has people happened. Of, whose lives are unworthy of That's living. That's it. I've heard that before somewhere. Did, yeah, where did we hear of that before? <laughs> <coughs> just just a, um, a comment from a biblical perspective to a certain extent that uh, may substantiate a little bit what is said here. <coughs> uh, the Bible seems to be talking about degeneration more than it does about evolution and advancement as a man proceeds, uh, both in terms of, you know, the length of time after, after the flood, the uh, length of life decreased dramatically uh, compared to before. Uh, seem, seems that uh, before then people seem to get along without the use of written language. We can't be sure for sure, but it seems like it. But then they became, it came a time when they had to write things down. But when they wrote them down, uh, the languages weren't the easiest things that at least we have trouble with some of those languages, uh, you know, uh, vowels left out, uh, uh, and uh, punctuation, and not, it was, apparently they were intelligent enough to figure it out. Uh, then we find ourselves, well, maybe we, we need printing uh, to get the message out. This is another case of probably more dependence. We find uh, Chinese language quite complex, but then they've invented a simple Chinese uh, to simplify that. And now we've got computers to help us, and a lot of us couldn't get along without them. Uh, I think we're degenerating. Well, the thing, is, the thing that's fascinating to me is that if you buy the post-flood uh, scenario, uh, then it looks like it probably came just before the Sumerian civilization. Um, because the Sumerian civilization ties its own history to the flood. That, um, for example, um, Gilgamesh actually visited Noah, according to the legends. And I think they're right, actually. And uh, so Noah was still alive. So we're talking about less than 350 years after the flood. Uh, that Gilgamesh was the king of Uruk at a particular time is now established because they found bricks with his name stamped in them. Um, and the name of one of the people he fought against and the name of his father, apparently. Uh, so there's, there's, there's this whole... This whole thing, it looks like it took us less than 300 years <coughs> to invent writing. And probably less than 100 years. 
The other interesting thing is writing in China seems to have come up at about the same time as a civilization. Now, maybe it takes writing to do civilization. Uh, but writing in China goes, down, goes back to uh, close to 2,000 years BC. And uh, if Mesopotamian civilization has been extended, which is one of my kind of private hypotheses, uh, then it's, it's distinctly possible that Sumerian and Chinese came from the same general uh, era. Um, uh, one of these days when I have nothing else to do, <coughs> it would be very, very interesting to compare uh, ancient Chinese writing and ancient Sumerian writing and see if there's a relationship between the two. Um, and there could be, even though the languages might be different, for the simple reason that what's written is actually not the, the language in the way that we would write, where you have letters that mean certain sounds that uh, uh, that instead what you have pictures that in some cases evoke a story and in some cases uh, I, I think Ethel Nelson has done a pretty good job of s suggesting that the uh, that the very earliest ones evoked the flood story and some of them looked like they may have even evoked a, uh, a, um, a creation story as well. Uh, which means that in order to interpret them, you have to know the story behind them. Mm, the Mayan civilization appears to have appeared kind of almost de novo. Uh, and we know enough about the writing to be able to sort of sometimes interpret it. Um, but it looks like it looks like writing came relatively easily, and to people groups that were fairly widely dispersed, uh, and that suggests that writing comes quasi naturally. Just a minute. Go ahead. Oh, we've been describing uh, evolution in terms of movement. It's been my observation that this movement doesn't move linearly, it moves in eddies. It goes up and down at the same time. And when, when you look at evolution, you have to figure out which has more staying power, the up movement or the down movement. You might have more down movement, but it has no staying power. You have, more, you have some up movement, but it stays there. So it's not, you can't describe it in linear terms, whether it's all going up or all going down. It, doesn't, it goes up and down at the same time. Well, the, the, the major problem that I have is that there are certain, uh, Fox Pro, I believe, is one of them, the genes where there's enough of a change between uh, great apes and humans as to where I think it's, if I remember the statistics correctly, it's like 16 separate mutations that it takes to go to the human genome. Whereas from uh, various other animals, there might be two or three mutations difference uh, in, the, in the entire, uh, you know, from mice to, uh, to monkeys. Um, this one looks like it was specifically made for humans. And interestingly enough, when it is mutated, they can't talk, or they find it very difficult to talk. Um, and language is a problem for them. Uh, almost as if it took a design to make those specific 16 mutations. How you get them mm -hmm. accidentally is not clear. The odds of that happening are just, well, astronomical if you think about it. And there are a few of uh, genes that are not studied very much by modern science, or, and what studying is not is not always well known, um, where you have complete open reading frame germs uh, genes. That is to say, they should code for proteins, 
We have no clue as to which proteins, proteins they code for or where. And they're brand new genes for humans only. They don't, not just 16 mutations as in the Fox Pro gene, but the entire gene is new for humans. And we have no clue as to what those things do, whether they are the specific ones that top us off in terms of our intelligence or not. And it's entirely possible that, that, that we are in fact a completely new creation in terms of the animal world. And uh, of course that hasn't been investigated very much, which is kind of in a way too bad. Um, and uh, it's possible that it's being investigated and we just aren't hearing about it. Uh, of course, if it turns out that it actually does show something, that those particular genes are important for human development, uh, it's really hard to see how you can get there from an evolutionary perspective. And I, that, I think, is one of the really big things about looking at this. You know, the evidence that he gives is one of degeneration. The uh, the evolutionary story has to have it going up. But there's really no evidence for that. Not unless you assume that evolution is true. Go, go ahead and then... Uh, we'll um, I just wanted to make a comment regarding civilization and writing. I would like to suggest that uh, while you have a family or a tribe-based society, you don't really need writing at that stage because you have essentially the oral communication that is passed on from one generation to the next and from one person to the next. However, once you develop uh, a, a higher level society, then what is essential for that society to function is records. So you that either party can appeal to them later on so if they feel they've been... You see, so essentially the higher order society gives birth to some form of record keeping. And that record keeping would be the beginnings of a written language exactly. in some form. You cannot have that kind of level organization without record keeping. That's impossible. Yeah. And in fact... Um, as somebody has once said, money is just simply a fancy way of keeping score. And you, you really need to keep score if you have a lot of people who are... There, there's no cohesion. Otherwise, you're going to have to have something that will allow people to settle differences without uh, killing the losers. And in a tribal society, that can be the patriarch who is the final judge. What he says goes. Uh, once, uh, if you get a society, you can have the king, but there will be people for whom, number one, the king can't do it for everybody, as Moses found out. And number two, the king, uh, in some cases, people might be reluctant to rely on the, uh, get the king involved because uh, the king might turn out to be more arbitrary. And then, you know, you might as well just flip the coin. Whereas if you have records and both parties can agree to them, then if there's a problem with memory or a deliberate problem with memory, you can always pull the records out and agree to, to, to deal with that on the basis of the records. And your example of Moses is a wonderful example because he had to put forward the entire Torah so that yeah. the people would have something to work on. Well, and, and he was judging from day, uh, daybreak to day to when the daylight let go and and he couldn't he still couldn't see all the cases that were there and that's why he appointed people here and people there and people there to, and then you know if it's tough you can bring it to me otherwise just take care of it yourself well writing is a way of taking care of yourself so you don't have to bother the king go ahead uh, we have comment a couple of comments here well, I got a little question. Uh, there's a lot of people 
in the church here that I go to Sabbath school, I do Bible studies and all this, and they think that the Lord hasn't come yet because we haven't gotten something or that we need to discover something in the Bible or discover some secret, you know, and they'll finally come because of that. Uh, what would happen if, if um, this race between finding whatever the secret is and the race of deterioration, that the deterioration wins? Uh, are we going <laughs> to... Are we going to be in big trouble? Is the Lord going to be big trouble for when he, uh, for what he's trying to do here with the great controversy and whatever? Well, I, I think we, I think we may be coming to a point where, uh, where that kind of thing may be present, and eventually, if I see that it looks like it's working enough, I may even uh, throw in my two cents worth into what what I think might be the the key here, and I suspect it's going to turn out to be something surprisingly simple, but something that most of us just don't get around to doing. Um, it reminds me of the verse, I think, in Revelation, which it's, uh, where it says, but if the days were not shortened, nobody would be left. Oh, well, that's a great deterioration. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have a, a comment back there. Well, before we turn into the primordial ooze again, um, maybe uh, I was thinking your comment about, um, well, we're seem to be kind of separate from the animal kingdom to some degree. I mean, I, I w this is kind of the dilemma I always think about is, um, you know, I mean, our, we don't really have fur, we have hair, and we're the only creature on Earth, as far as I know, with hair on the top of his head. Basically, there's a primary source I mean, no other creatures like that. Uh, how we'd survive, I mean, it would be quite difficult to, uh, you know, without the Walmarts and the grocery stores and the, you know, clothes on our back and things like this. If, if, if that group of things were to be knocked out, I think most of us would not survive for very long because we have no clue as to how to grow food or where to get it if it's not Grown. Well, animals don't grow food, but well, generally, as f there may be a few exceptions, but <laughs> um, you know, they know how to survive. They know how to where to get it. Well, yeah, but if see, if you're a deer, you can always eat plants, just straight out. Whereas we're not quite that good. We're we're more like bears in that regard, in the, in the terms of what we can tolerate to eat. Well, there bears don't eat a lot of grass. There was a, a races on this continent that did eat with. You know, uh, well, survive without the uh, all the uh, r modern uh, conveniences. But uh, the, the Indians, uh, for an example, um, they lived a fairly fairly natural life. They did make their own tools and things like this, uh, teepees uh, for living and things like this. But uh, which is would stand out in the animal kingdom too. But yeah, yeah. Well, I mean that's. Um, the fact of the matter is most of us are trained to do a whole bunch of different things, but most of what we're not trained to do is to survive without uh, modern conveniences. We do depend on food that other people grew. Right. Uh, and if those other people stop growing them or we stop getting transport, uh, you know, the Central Valley in California will do okay. Um, the rest of us, well, not so much, and especially the big cities will be in big trouble because they don't grow their own food. Well, all that has to happen is the, the whatever, the sun, uh, that radiation, the uh, cancel, the, uh, blow up the transformers, right? That's, they've already been shown that it's, it would, it's potential, potential could do that. Cuts off the gas supply, nobody can get out of here. Cuts off all the water supply, it's all run by electrical pumps. Yeah, it's well, if you, days. If, if you were suddenly left with the gas in your tank and that was it, and, no, uh. and, the wa and the water in your toilet bowl. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, my, my son was at, in Japan when the big earthquake hit. And uh, um, he had the presence of mind to run his bathtub full of water. Uh, but three days afterwards, all you could get in Tokyo was fish heads. 
Uh, I, mean, I won't say that that's true for every single bit of Tokyo, but at least for the area that he was in, you know, there, there's basically nothing. And uh, you think about it, you know, we're not that far from that kind of stuff if, uh, if a natural disaster were to take out, uh, you know, any more with our cars with, uh, uh, with computer chips in them. All you'd have to do is have a good electromagnetic pulse and we'd be totally paralyzed as a nation. Well, this, this, this you know, all those wonderful uh, gas sipping cars that, you know, get 50 miles to the gallon and whatnot, you know, you wipe out the computer, they're toast. Yeah. I mean, they're not just toast when they run out of fuel, they're toast now. Right, right. In fact, for most of us that have electronic fuel injection, our cars would be toast too. So only the old carbureted without the computer. <laughs> That's Going right. Back to the 70s, That's right. The old Model T's would still 60s, be running. 70s. You know, there was another. I just want to mention real quick. Uh, there was a vote on this uh, with the pul uh, Sun um, a Pulse uh, in Congress, I believe, and uh, the it was he was killed in the Senate or something like that, or vice versa. I forget which one. But but it was it passed it in, unanimously, and then they killed it. Too politically charged, or whatever it was. Uh, they they can they can uh, well they can uh, in the electrical grid, they can without great deal of expense they can uh, put um, like a a breaker essentially like with your computer you plug into a breaker switch that if it gets you know, a surge protector yeah surge protector yeah yeah go ahead uh, yeah I wonder if this guy could give an estimate it'd be really interesting to see until. Um, how much time we have left till we get on to idiocracy level? Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, and here's another thing. I wonder uh, if why don't we see this going on in the animal kingdom, or, um, or do we? Well, well. For example, if you have a wild animal that had been raised uh, and thus domesticated in a sense, and then turned out in the wild, that that animal is incapable of providing for itself. Yeah. It, it is going to be in dire straits. Well, it it simply has no skills that it would need to cope. Well, it's an interesting question, and I think it's an important one. Uh, why aren't all the other animals dying? And then uh, you stop and we always blame it on the environment, and I think that uh, there's a sense in which part of that's true. Uh, but you look at you look at how many endangered species there are, and you'll notice that many of them, hmm. not all of them, but many of them are in fact the larger animals. Hmm. And uh, although I think the time frame is off from this traditional one, you look back and uh, there are some animals that appear to be post-flood uh, that also didn't make it. The uh, ground sloths. The, uh, the saber-toothed tigers, the mammoths. Mammoths are certainly post-flood. Uh, so, and, and this is one of the problems that we're having with condors right now, is that after you get, after you get so low a population, there is enough genetic damage that there may be a point beyond which you just simply can't resurrect them again. The theory is, of course, by you know, kind of standard way of looking at things. Well, all you need is a w one male, one female, and then you know, just have them breed and have their offspring take over. And and uh, yeah, they'll have a higher death rate because they're consanguineous and all that. But um, but enough of them will survive to where you can populate an island. Um, and in fact, uh, in humans, Pitcairn Island is kind of that way. Uh, but uh, but if you have a if you have a low enough population, the genetics mean that you may not be able to make it. And if that happens, you go extinct. And it has happened in history. And you know, with my view of history, 
It's happened in fairly short times in history. The mammoths once were, they are now no longer. And we find frozen mammoths that radiocarbon date to the time of the pharaohs up in uh, Russia. Let's see. I'm trying to remember my question. That was too interesting. It got my brain off. Well, um, we're looking forward to the Grand Canyon in a few weeks, and we'll be getting to the uh, the quarterly when we have uh, the chance. And so, uh, hopefully, uh, we'll be getting. Uh, uh, We'll be having more fun as time goes on, and uh, I'll be announcing the next few as uh, Sabbath schools as we get to them. <laughs>